I thought videos like this would not be necessary. I thought people were better than this. But I was wrong. Recently, the Aviation Gate Club had an article in which the Su-57 is presented as an outdated aircraft built a technology that could be innovative in 1985, but obsolete in 2024. The article, though, is not original. The Aviation Gate Club is actually reporting on a very popular answer on Quora by a contributor with many answers and millions of views. I want to be clear, the Aviation Geek Club is an excellent website. I follow it regularly and I invite you to do the same. They have been very kind with me in the past when they allowed me to use one of the articles as the base for an old video of mine. It was about the giraffe missions during the Iran-Iraq war. You can check it out because at the time the channel was tiny and it did not have much traction. So the Aviation Geek Club is not responsible for the content. And since I know them as smart guys, I don't think they really agree with it. It would probably have been better to let that discussion where it was on Quora because it is almost complete nonsense. The piece on Quora, which I won't show not to give it undue publicity, is the usual short essay where the author all over the Su-57 while celebrating the brilliant American achievements. Now, I'm not disturbed by this kind of attitude that happens all the time. Everyone is free to think and say whatever they want. What disturbs me, really disturbs me, is the claim that the Su-57 is a reskinned Su-35, therefore it can be stealth, it can be modern, and so on and so on. Well, this is disheartening. It is enough to look at a few pictures to see the difference, and if you don't see it honestly, yeah. But enough with ranting, we have the interesting opportunity to understand how and why aircraft designs are different. In fact, we are going to compare the Su-35 and the Su-57 and see why they are not the same aircraft. This is a picture of the Su-35 where we can see the plan form. Do you notice how the wing leading and trailing edges are both swept back? The Su-35 wing is a classic swept back wing. This type of wings are pretty common and their main purpose is to reduce the shockwave drag at transonic speeds. Now, the most important feature of the wing, the one that defines its performance, is the aerofoil. That is, the transverse section of the wing. In a swept back wing, the aerofoils are not parallel to the airflow, they are at an angle determined by the sweep. This is a picture of the Su-57, and here we can see the platform too. Here you can notice that the leading edge is swept, but the trailing edge is not. This is a different type of wing, it is a modern delta wing, whose profile is a hybrid between the classic delta wing, which relies on vortices for lift, and a conventional wing which produces lift by having a section shaped like an aerofoil. In this wing, the aerofoil, which is much more complex than that of the Su-35, is parallel to the aircraft axis. This would be enough to utterly, utterly disprove the reskinning idea. If two aircraft feature such radically different wings, they will not be the same by definition, the wing is the key element that determines the aerodynamic behavior of the aircraft. If there is such a radical difference, all the performance parameters will be different. You may say, well, it's just the outside, inside they are the same. No, in the swept back wing, the main spars and the ribs will be swept too. On a delta wing, the main spar and the ribs are not swept, they are perpendicular to the aircraft axis. The difference from a structural point of view is massive. The swept back wing will be more flexible than the delta. The aeroelastic behavior will be drastically different. 
Unfortunately, I couldn't find any picture or cutaway I could use for copyright issues, but I invite you to Google them and see for yourself. But this is not the end, let's go on. This is a picture of the Su-35 from above. In front of the wing, there are these extensions that in English are called LERCs, leading edge root extensions. This is, from an aerodynamic point of view, a small delta wing positioned in front of the main wing. Its purpose is to generate the classic delta wing vortices when the angle of incidence increases. Increasing the angle of incidence is necessary to turn the aircraft. The more you increase it, the more lateral acceleration you can generate in a turn. The vortices create additional lift even when the main wing is stalled, and in the case of the Su-35 you can see how they flow onto the vertical stabilizers, maintaining their effectiveness in yaw. This is a Su-57 from above. You can see that the aircraft doesn't have lurks. Where the lurks would be, we have these mobile surfaces called the levcons. These are mobile surfaces whose main purpose is to keep the flow attached to the central section of the aircraft body when moved together and impede the aircraft spin departure when they're moved asymmetrically. Moreover, their deflection slightly moves the aircraft aerodynamic center back and forth, thus increasing the possible center of gravity excursion. This is important for the Su-57 because it has two long weapon bays. If one is full and the other is empty, the center of gravity can move around quite a bit. The Su-57 makes use of a non-linear lift, but not from the lurks. The vortices are generated by this section of the wing, and they flow over the vertical stabilizers, in this case as well. So, as you can clearly see, the Su-57 is much more aerodynamically sophisticated than the Su-35. The Su-57 aerodynamic design is probably the most sophisticated that has ever flown in a combat aircraft. And incidentally, this is why I like this aircraft so much. It is also clear how the objection that it is just the exterior doesn't hold water. Both aircraft have a central body that generates lift, but the Su-35 is proportionally much, much smaller than the Su-57, with an entirely different configuration, and it is obvious that you can't recycle the internal structure of the Su-35 to make a Su-57. But this is not enough. Let's go on. We often use the term wings as a plural, but an aircraft has only one wing with a left and a right half. In fact, the wing structure is continuous and the aircraft fuselage can be either placed on top of it or hung underneath, as it is evident in airliners or transport aircraft. On modern fighters, though, this distinction between wing and fuselage is somewhat blurred because the central body and the fuselage don't seem to be clearly distinguishable. Both on the Su-35 and the Su-57, between the two wings, there is a group of very strong bulkheads that form a box structure with the stringers and the longer ones, very stiff and very robust. These bulkheads support the weight of the aircraft, uh, the undercarriage loads, and the engine thrust. Again, I have no illustrations of this that can be used, but there are cutaways on the internet, a bit approximate, that show the internal structure. Both the Su-35 and the Su-57 have the engines positioned in external nacelles, attached under the central lifting body. But this is where the similarity ends. The Su-35 has a frontal fuselage segment shaped like a spindle, where the cockpit, the radar, and the nose gear are located. There's also a tail extension where various sensors and avionics are positioned. Above the aircraft, there is a fairing that joins the two, which creates some more interior room, but it is not structural, it is not load-bearing. The Su-57, on the contrary, has a real fuselage from nose to tail, and quite a hefty one. It must have to make room for the two weapon bays, which are quite long and deep. About 40% of the fuselage length is indeed a weapon bay on the Su-57, where there is none on the Su-35. Actually, having these long bays poses a serious challenge to the aircraft's structural rigidity, and in fact the bays are split in two to house a pretty substantial continuous section where I can easily imagine the main bulkheads go through without being interrupted by the weapon bays. How could someone think 
that the Su-57 is just a reskinning of the Su-35 with these structural differences clearly visible in all the pictures, it is beyond me. The very fact that one aircraft has weapon base and the other has none implies a radically different fuselage structural design. But this is not the end, let's go on. If we look at the Su-35 from the side, we notice that the size of the vertical stabilizers is quite large in proportion to the lateral section of the rest of the aircraft. There are also two rather large ventral surfaces which are there to help with the yaw stability at high angles of attack. The horizontal stabilizer is positioned lower than the wing. This means that it is in the middle of the wing downwash. The angle of attack of the tail surface is reduced, delaying its stall and preserving the authority. Moreover, in case of stall, it is well clear from the turbulent flow detaching from the wing, which is essential to regain control. If we look at the Su-57 from the side, we notice that the size of the vertical stabilizers is quite small relatively to the lateral section of the aircraft, and there are no ventral surfaces. This is important for stealth because it just reduces the surface exposed to the radiation. I believe that the yaw stability is augmented by the slightly divergent orientation of the nozzles, which is not present on the Su-35. And by the way, this is also useful when one engine fails to maintain the lateral stability as well. Moreover, the fact that the vertical surfaces are entirely mobile increases their maneuvering authority compared with a split surface, but it requires that the flight control keeps correcting the aircraft. Since all unstable design aircraft do it around the pitch axis, I see no particular issue doing it around the yaw axis as well. Both aircraft use 3D thrust vectoring, which may help with stability as well, but in case of stall, the airflow into the engines is disrupted and the thrust is lower, therefore it can't be really relied upon to exit spin. The horizontal stabilizer on the Su-57 is in line with the wing. This is a less effective placement than one on the Su-35, but it is another low observability feature, reducing the frontal surface of the aircraft and the possibility of radiation bouncing between the wing and the tail. This may reduce its effectiveness during stall and spin, and this could be a consideration that further supported the Levcon's adoption. From the tail design, it is quite clear that these two aircraft have a rather different flight control philosophy. One is quite old and rather conventional, the other is much more modern, given the constraints posed by stealth. By now, I could go on talking about the materials, the engines, the systems, the avionics and so on. However, all these features are not visible to the casual observer, while the shape of the aircraft clearly is. It is enough to look at the pictures with a modicum of attention to realize that the Su-57 is a completely new aircraft, and it's not a skin Su-35. And if you don't see it now, I honestly don't know what to do more. So thank you very much for watching this rather unusual video. I hope it was interesting and it is a privilege having had your attention. I have to say the usual enormous thank you to all those who support the channel financially. You can do on Patreon, you can do by being a member. And now there is also a GoFundMe, which is actually connected with a book that I'm trying to write. It's a long-term project, but if you're interested, there will be the link in the description below and a QR code on screen. If you can support the channel, which is absolutely fine, uh, please subscribe if you haven't, uh, hit the bell, uh, hit like, it helps immensely with the algorithms. So this is the end, thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Hi, this is the editing gas uh, the day after. I actually realized that I am using a lot of concepts that I didn't explain in depth in this video, but these are sort of basic concepts on how airplanes work and literally there will be no time, it will take hours and hours and hours to explain them in any detail. So sometimes I wonder if a Back to Basics series of videos would be interesting. I don't know. Please let me know in the comments below. And again, thank you for watching.